I'm Bob Bolton from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and this is Alaska Voices, a place for communities to connect through conversation in order to build a better tomorrow for Alaskans and the world. Originally, I grew up in Gakona, Alaska. Tyonic. Egypt. Idaho. Rampart. St. Lawrence Island. St. Paul. And I'm here with my student. My science buddy. My teacher. My homie. I'm his daughter. Hi, my name is Fred Clark. I'm 61 years of age with my partner here, my new colleague, Kurt. My name is Kurt Ilo. I'm 54 years old, and we are in the Denina Center, conference center here in Anchorage at the Alaska Forum on the Environment. And I am here with Fred Clark, one of our keynote speakers at the conference. So you got to talk to the forum a little about who you are. Mm-hmm. You didn't tell us anything about your parents. Tell me about your parents. Other than they had a junkyard, right? So that's what they did for a living is my dad ran a wrecker. They were both born in Kansas. My mom, she's the Potawatomi in my okay. family. Okay. So that's where I get my descendancy. My Potawatomi descendancy goes to a tribal leader from the Great Lakes area called Leopold Pukagan. And he had a bunch of daughters and they all married French traders. He brought in the black goats too and started this connection between my tribe and the Catholic Church that spanned 300 years. But eventually, a lot of Potawatomi were moved out of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Illinois. The Cherokee and the Creek have the Trail of Tears. But we call ours Trail of Death because so many people died in in being removed by the federal government to Kansas. So my mom had that Potawatomi background that she never was connected with because she grew up in an orphanage with a bunch of her younger siblings. Then when I was young, my parents moved to Idaho, which is where the junkyard was, and set up business there in this farming area that was just really growing. So I wasn't really connected with my Potawatomi heritage until I was older, like in my 20s, was when I really started digging into that. Into your culture. Into my culture. I went from growing up in a junkyard to becoming an anthropologist and archaeologist. And so your mother wasn't that attached to her, her culture? Or, no, uh, no. She was all, learning so. just like the rest of us. It was great to see her reach out. So I'd really like to hear a little bit about where you come from and how you ended up to be the executive director for Alaska Forum on the Environment. So almost 30 years ago, I moved here from New Jersey. I worked for the Environmental Protection Agency there in New York City where I commuted two hours each way to work every day and made it about eight months and transferred immediately to Alaska. Um, I love it here. It's an amazing place to be. Um, But I got here just before the Exxon Valdez oil spill, was an enforcement officer for EPA. And let's say about five years into that career, I realized that the enforcement work we were doing was limited because we were only pointing out the bad things people were doing, and we weren't doing the other things that needed to correct the action, like education. And that's where our ideas for the forum started. There's a lot of environmental concerns throughout the villages, throughout our communities, and so uh, we reach out to all those problems now. So there's something that I wanted to ask you about, Kurt. You know, you've got all these people who come to the forum, and they have information that they've gotten from one way or another, information sources that they're sharing. Is it just a huge diversity of sources, or are there some primary elements from which people draw? We used to have a group of elders meet, and they would sit down with the highest federal agency folks in Alaska. So we would have an elder woman named Lane, a wonderful woman who passed away a short while ago. A Clinkett elder would be sitting next to a four-star general from the Air Force. But the best interaction was when when Lane, who was all four feet tall, I think, asked the general for one of his stars off of his <laughs> uniform to put on a regalia. And uh, he's like, you know, he'd be out of uniform. I don't think he's legally allowed to do that. But I did notice she had a star on her regalia after that lunch. It was like the best <laughs> interaction I've ever seen. That yeah, is pretty awesome. Was super humble. <laughs> Super cute. This isn't a conference of, you know, just about, let's say, EPA regulations or the newest climate change from just the Climate Change Center. It's every single federal agency has something here to say. You can see the Park Service here. You can see Forest Service here. You can see uh, Russian Orthodox folks here. There are priests here. We have military generals here some years. And so all of those are sources of information for them to learn. And I think that diversity is probably one of the best things that happens here. 
I almost feel guilty that everybody who comes here, the 1,200 people, are exchanging so much information. And most of it's not good news. Maybe it's information where we can help make a difference, but it's usually just understanding a problem more. It's so overwhelming. The scope of problems that we face in all our communities, and then the, let alone climate change on an international or world level problems, but well, sanitation issues and landfill issues to just amazing amount of information from everywhere. Yeah, that's the impression that I get. And when you get people like the Western scientists and the elders and the people who have grown up in that place and their language is actually derived from that landscape, and that is just a magical, magical thing. And a big part of this is the information sharing between the communities as well. So they talk about success stories and what they've accomplished the last couple of years and share that. So that becomes a huge learning opportunity for other communities who yeah. see those same problems. And that's not a traditional source of information that we think about. We think about university kind of information, the scientists putting out a brochure or something, but it's really this exchange that's happening over a cup of coffee between two communities. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we can't, how do you put a value, a metric on the cup of coffee that the two people had? It's triangulating information that really turns into knowledge that you can use. And that's the point, I think, is for me, knowledge is belief that works. So people bring in their beliefs about scientific information. They bring in their beliefs as traditional people on the landscape. They bring in their beliefs from their families. And then getting together, you figure out what actually works, what you can do to adapt to a changing climate. What can you do to adapt to melting permafrost? And it's only through that discussion and those conversations that we're going to come to any realistic way to make a difference in people's lives, to move ahead in a positive way. So it's, it's a great training ground. It is. Everybody here I mean, feels affected by uh, real impacts by climate change. You know, we're seeing lots of differences, and I think the, the impacts are unfortunately hitting the, some of our most economically challenged communities first. Right. I work a lot in the, the realm of environmental justice, and that's exactly what that means. Exactly. Is that those people can, uh, who can afford it the least are affected the most. And that's a hard bar to move, I think. Yes, true. But at least we're trying, and that's the positive note. Well, we have to have hope. Mm -hmm. And without that, there's only despair, I suppose. And we can't move a bar without the hope. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, thanks, Kurt. It's Thank good you. talking with you. Appreciate spending time with me today. Alaska Voices builds bridges by creating a space where community members, friends, policymakers, and scientists can share stories and place based knowledge. This project was developed in partnership with StoryCorps and was funded by the Alaska Climate Adaptation Science Center. Additional funding was provided by the University of Alaska Fairbanks Chancellor through a generous gift from the Bentley Family Trust. Alaska Voices would not be possible without the help and efforts of an amazing group of people. Our producer and audio engineer is Kelsey Skomberg of Mossy Stone Media. Our podcast and outreach specialist is Michael Delu, And our website designer is Carolyn Rosner. If you are interested in more conversations or information, please visit our website at alaskavoices.org.